of the modifiable risk factors. And we're going to take it from a perspective of what you can do at home, what uh, physical therapists can do for you, what our center does for you, and things that you can do to help yourself. Next slide. So let's just talk a little bit about back pain. 85% of all Americans will have a back problem at some point in their lives. Um, that's pretty significant. That doesn't mean that everybody has it at the same time. It's just at some point in your life, you may experience it. 31 million Americans, however, that's about a little less than 10% of our population will be suffering with back problems at any given moment. Uh, low back pain worldwide has become the leading cause of disability. Um, and this has been published in research, uh, published in a journal called Lancet. And lastly, the Amer Americans spend, uh, this number is a little outdated, it's actually approaching $100 billion per year on back pain treatments. It's the number one source of chronic back pain. Um, and most importantly, the rate of recurrence for back pain is 50% in one year and almost 80% within two years in some research studies because people tend not to correct the root cause and correct some of the recurrence risk factors. So what's normal as we age? You know, everybody thinks as we get older, you know, we have some wear and tear in our joints, which is true. Um, so occasional stiffness in your neck or back that, you know, if you're out there playing a sport on the weekend and, you know, the weekend warrior and your back is sore and it goes away in a couple of days, that's normal. You probably strain muscles that aren't strong enough. And the same thing with, you know, right now everybody's outside gardening and raking leaves and getting your yards ready if you have a house. Um, and so you might be stiff and sore after that. So those are normal aches and pains. What's not normal? Well, any sudden or severe pain, so on a scale of zero to 10, if you have a pain that's up around the eight, nine, or 10 out of 10 level, with 10 being the worst, that's not normal. Burning or stabbing pain, uh, if that comes and you experience that, that tends to signify some sort of neurologic issue. Unrelenting, unrelenting chronic pain, so chronic pain is anything that you've had for more than three months. If the pain isn't going away in three months, that's, that's usually indicative of something that's not a typical little wear and tear or a weekend warrior kind of thing. Uh, chest pain or difficulty breathing, that's certainly a very concerning thing that needs to be looked at. Loss of normal bowel bladder function, loss of muscle weak, you know, progressive muscle weakness. If you have a fever with your pain, severe headaches like you've never had before. And lastly, we talked a little bit about burning, but same thing with numbness. Those are not normal findings. So let's dispel some of the common age-related pain myths. And this is based on some research studies that we pulled from research journals. So pain is just a natural part of aging and getting older. Yeah, I'm just getting old. The pain I have is just part of that. Well, actually studies show that despite the highest prevalence of back pain at age 65, that means that people who are 65 tend to develop back pain, pain typically declines with advancing age. In fact, chronic pain disorders are less common with advancing age. Uh, another myth is pain worsens over time. It is widely believed that pain worsens with age, but studies show that pain is actually episodic, means it comes and goes and doesn't increase as you get older. Pushing through the pain makes it easier to tolerate. So that's a big mistake and a big myth. Acceptance of pain doesn't, man it may, doesn't make it any easier to tolerate. Pushing through pain that you have or have had for a while actually can worsen a chronic disorder and severity of pain can lead to depression as well as sleep disorders, which negatively impacts your health. So those are some common myths that we need to get away from. So what are some of the age-related physical changes that some people experience? Well, as you know, women tend to be very prone to osteoporosis. We won't get into the physiology of why that happens, but just to review, osteoporosis is characterized by progressive thinning of bone. Um, you can take a look at that picture down on your lower right, and you can see a woman on your left that's about 40 years your age. You can look at the matrix of bone where it says normal, and you can see how dense the bone is with very little air pocket spaces. As you get to be 20 years later, 60 years of age, you can see that the amount of bone in that cross-sectional matrix is decreasing. So the mass, the bone mass is reduced. And then lastly, as we approach 70, you can see that the postural change is happening. There's a shortening of uh, our, our length at our height. And then if you look at the far left normal picture of the bone matrix versus the far right, there's very little bone, a lot more air spaces, and that's considered osteoporosis. So osteoporosis can be a factor for pain, especially in women. Um, what causes osteoporosis? Well, some things can cause it, prolonged prednisone therapy, um, hormonal issues, but things that are that can help you prevent that is getting enough calcium and vitamin D in your diet, um, keeping bones and muscles strong by exercising, avoiding tobacco and excess alcohol, 
Uh, treatment wise, if you do have osteoporosis and you're experiencing back pain, uh, and this is definitely an age related um, problem with women, uh, prescription medication to increase bone density. And then lastly, to minimize bone loss, um, proper nutrition, make sure you're not vitamin D deficient. Research is now showing that in America, 70% of our population is vitamin D deficient. With vitamin D being deficient, it absolutely affects bone mass and it affects bone pain. Um, and also through exercise, weight-bearing exercise, walking, um, using weights while you're walking, any type of exercise like that will actually help. What are some other age-related physical changes that can become symptomatic? Well, spinal arthritis. Uh, arthritis just means joints that are starting to get extra calcium because they're wearing. The friction as it ages causes joint bone formation to occur. So if you take a look at the bottom picture on your far left, you can see that the anatomy, um, you can see where it points to disc, then it point, then you have a bone. And then as we go further down, you can see that the space between the vertebrae, where the disc is very, very thin, becomes narrow. As that occurs, you get degeneration or arthritic spurring at what we call the facet joint, which is, you can see that arrow pointing to where the joint is. So there's bony overgrowth at that joint. That causes restriction of motion, it causes inflammation, it can cause pain and stiffness, and as a result, it can cause pain. And yes, as we get older, that's something that can happen and actually become symptomatic. Another age-related change is spinal stenosis. So spinal stenosis actually very commonly refers to narrowing of the spaces inside the spinal canal. Um, it's most common in the lower back and neck, and it can cause symptoms like pain in the back, pain in the leg, pain in the neck. Most commonly, this happens in the lower back, and it's often associated with leg pain, which we call claudication, that's worsened with walking. So if someone's walking and they notice that, oh, my legs hurt more, but then when I stop walking, it decreases my pain, that's typically lumbar spinal stenosis or neurogenic claudication, which is leg pain. Um, and it can also, people will notice as they stoop forward, it decreases it. So as you flex your spine away from the narrowing, so if you look at that picture in the middle, you can see how tight it is where it, call, where, where it points to stenosis or narrowing versus up higher where you see a normal dimension of the spinal canal. So as you lean forward away from that, it actually makes more space and it decreases your pain. So that's actually called a shopping cart sign. So people who bend forward or notice that when they're leaning forward, it decreases their pain. That actually um, is spinal stenosis. And it's very, it's very common in, as we get older, especially into our 70s and 80s. And lastly, degenerative disc disease. <clears throat> so you can see the healthy disc in that picture below. That disc is pretty thick. Then when you look at the disc that's getting thinner, what happens is those two vertebral bones, those two bones get closer to one another. So the hole where the nerve comes out, that yellow nerve that comes out between the bones behind the disc gets inflamed because it's impinged or it's pinched. So that's how you can get a pinched nerve. And all three of these conditions are uh, seen as we get older. Now, let me just qualify that. We can take 100 people off the street that are 65 or older, MRI or X-ray, every one of them. And out of those 100 people, we may see these types of findings that I just talked about in probably 65%. And the criteria for X-raying those people were absolutely no symptoms whatsoever. So the point I'm trying to make is, yes, these can cause symptoms, but they don't have to. It's just sometimes there and not clinical and not symptomatic. The job of a good clinician is to determine which is the pain generator, if at all, it's coming from one of these three things. Next slide. So some common and uncommon causes of back pain as we get older, um, mechanical back pain, well, we just talked about the joints a little bit. We talked about radiculopathy or in English pinched nerves. I showed you some discs that actually deteriorate and can bulge, weak muscles and bones, osteoporosis, scoliosis. Those are common causes of back pain as we get older. <clears throat> uncommon causes, but we have to be alert for, are things like infection, um, fever, uh, unrelenting chronic severe pain that's not going away, cancer, other medical conditions, and corticoquina syndrome, which is a compression of the spinal cord, um, which can cause some of those symptoms I mentioned earlier, like um, loss of bowel or bladder function or foot drop. So let's talk about some modifiable risk factors. So yes, as we get older, those types of degenerative changes and those things that we just talked about, ranging from arthritis to spinal stenosis, um, osteoporosis, those are things that generally happen to us, but they don't necessarily have to cause symptoms all the time. Like I said, there are studies that have been shown that asymptomatic people in that age group can have all of those findings yet have no problems. 
That doesn't mean that the next day they may not bend over to pick something up and kind of stir the bee's nest and actually now become symptomatic. So to prevent those kinds of things from happening, there are some modifiable risk factors that make you more prone to making those things happen or becoming symptomatic. One of them is physical activity. Uh, no physical activity. You don't exercise. You sit on the couch all day and watch TV and do nothing. That eventually is going to cause a lot of muscle atrophy, poor posture, smoking. Research has shown that smoking is significant for causing back disorders and making it symptomatic. Uh, in these times, psychological and anxiety and stress are another one. Obviously, obesity. And we're going to talk about all these in a little more depth in a minute. And then diet and nutrition. And then lastly, medical problems that can actually predispose you to having uh, back issues and making the things that we just talked about become symptomatic. So lack of exercise. So with lack of exercise, um, what happens is when you're sitting around, two things can occur. One is the muscles that support your spine become weaker and weaker. They actually start to atrophy and atrophy means they decrease in size and those muscles surround the spine. So if those muscles are no longer strong enough to support the spine, Excuse me a second. Um, they allow structural um, defects to occur and put extra stress on the discs, the joints, and the nerves. The other thing that happens is as you sit around and now you've developed some pain because you're not exercising, those muscles weaken, it affects your mood, it affects your mental health, um, and it affects your sleep as well. Exercise has been shown to have significant healthy benefits that you can see on the right side of the screen. It improves your mood, it increases energy, it increases your bone strength, normalizes blood pressure, regulates body weight, reduces coronary artery disease, and strengthens muscles. And strong muscles lead to strong spine, which prevents those arthritic changes that we talked about before from becoming symptomatic. Exercise is critical. If you're not exercising, simply just getting out and walking is, is, is great. So core stability is really important. Now, I'm not sure, you know, with these webinars, it's hard to see the audience and who's actually watching. Um, so you can see what core stability exercises we're talking about. You know, obviously I wouldn't recommend these to somebody who's 70 years old. We would work with our PT department to come up with a better program for someone, but you can get an idea. You can do these on the floor. You can do these on a ball. Sometimes that makes it even easier. And even doing some core stability exercises, like you'd see on the figure six, a seated marching on a ball, well, you can actually do that seated marching on a chair. So these are stability exercises that actually help strengthen your spine and prevent um, symptoms from occurring, even though you may have some of those age-related changes, structural changes occurring to your spine. Next. So posture. You know, if I had to say in my 38 years of clinical practice, you know, posture is probably one of the most important things to address, and not just in people that are getting older. Uh, Posture probably is worse in people who are younger, but posture is a huge issue. For every inch or two inches actually that your head and neck shift forward as well as your upper back, it's like taking a 20 pound weight, leaving it on your head all day. And then you can, you can just imagine with a 20 pound weight on your head all day long, your back is going to hurt. So notice that with that forward head and neck posture, how the patient is pretty far away from the central long axis. Um, then we can talk about lower back posture. You can see in that middle picture, the abdomen is kind of weak, sticking out. The curve in the back where that blue curved arrow is, that's called a sway back or a hyperlordosis. When you have that kind of a posture, it's going to create lower back pain. Um, so posture is extremely important. And some of the things you just need to remember is to just kind of center your head over your spine. If you're sitting in a chair, put a pillow behind your back, put a stool under your feet so it forces you to be nice and erect, and same thing while you're standing. So posture is extremely important. Next. So seated posture, we just talked about that. So you can see in the picture on the right, um, that person is seated, his thighs are perpendicular to his calves. What I would suggest is to actually put something under your feet to flex your legs a little bit up so it's not completely perpendicular, so your thighs are a little angled upwards, that'll force your spine to be in a more erect position. And just take a roll towel or a back pillow and put it behind your lower back to give you extra support. So posture is extremely important. And the longer you sit, sitting is actually considered the new smoking today. The longer you sit, um, the more pressure it puts in your discs, the more pressure it puts in your joints. And then that can take a situation with those age-related changes that we talked about making you symptomatic. 
Next slide. So smoking, um, there's a lot of research now that shows that smoking not just doesn't affect your lungs, it causes cancer, it affects your GI system, it can affect your heart. Now there's a lot of research out there that shows there's a distinct relationship between back pain and smoking. And why is that? Well, because smoking has nicotine, which constricts our blood vessels, and our discs and joints of our back are extremely dependent on good circulation. So if our circulation is reduced, and now we're causing micro stress injuries and micro stress trauma to our joints and discs without the ability for the body to replenish its nutritional status to that area, it's eventually gonna break down and it's eventually gonna become symptomatic. So smoking, if you're a smoker, you have to try and stop. There are now surgeons who will not operate on somebody if they're smoking because it actually reduces the results and clinical outcome of surgery because of poor healing. So it affects healing, it affects back pain, and I, I, I encourage everybody who's a smoker to do whatever they can to do smoking cessation programs to stop. Next. So I'm going to hand over, we're going to keep going about different things. And uh, Caitlin Conville, who's our nurse practitioner coordinator here at the Back and Neck Pain Center, is going to talk about the effects of anxiety and stress. Thanks, Dr. Ben. Um, so another modifiable risk factor we see here with the experience of anxiety or stress. So when your body experiences a stressor, whether that be anxiety related to your job or the loss of a loved one, stress over bills, your sympathetic nervous system responds by releasing stress hormones. Now the release of stress hormones such as cortisol and catecholamines activate a bodily response in which the body prepares for an emergency response. And it does with this, it increases heart rate, respiratory rate, and muscle tension. So this fight or flight response is extremely useful from an evolutionary perspective, such that it prepares us to run away from danger or avoid bodily harm when faced with a threat to our lives. But regularly experiencing stress and therefore experiencing this fight or flight response can start to inflict harm on our bodies. So here on the right, you can see some of the effects of this regular experience of stress, um, including lack of concentration, low energy, headaches, increased pain, depression, a suppressed immune system, um, increased blood pressure and heart rate, joint pain, muscle tension, protein breakdown, decreased bone density, and a change in appetite leading to weight gain, among many others. Um, so with regard to the experience of pain, the experience of psychological stress in particular can have a negative cyclical effect on the body. So you can see this here on the left. You can see how psychological stress can lead to pain, as we discussed, which can then cause us to react to that pain with muscle guarding, which can then restrict our range of motion, which can then lead to muscle weakness and atrophy and decreased function, which in turn leads to more psychological distress. So now that we know some of the ways that chronic stress can affect our well-being, you know, we can look to ways to reduce our stress level on a daily basis. So some of those ways include eating a healthy diet, exercising regularly, developing good sleep habits, focusing on our breathing, um, and participating in meditation and yoga. So here we have two, um, two little infographics for you. So on, on the right, you can see these are some yoga poses that you can do at home in a chair, um, even just a dining room chair or at work. Um, and on the left here, we have a body scan meditation. So this shows just some of the benefits of uh, meditation and shows you how to perform that. So to do so, you would take a nice deep breath and just feel the different parts of your body one at a time. So focusing on the head and then the face, then the neck, so on down. Um, you know, taking the time out for meditation and yoga can really, um, you know, reduce stress and, and really help, um, help you to relax and, and help with your pain as well. Next slide. Okay, so obesity and poor nutrition. So another modifiable risk factor is obesity. And obesity in America has become increasingly prevalent with the latest CDC statistics indicating that 42.5% of adults over age 20 have a BMI that categorizes them as obese, while 73.6% of adults over the age of 20 are classified as overweight, uh, and that includes those with a BMI indicating obesity. So multiple studies have been conducted to study the relationship between back pain and increased body size, um, and a meta-analysis of these studies found that being overweight or obese was a significant factor in both developing and perpetuating back pain. So as you can see here on the right, when our bodies are a healthy weight, um, our systemic levels of inflammation are low, we have low levels of mechanical stress on our low back, and the ground reaction force is low. So as our body size increases, those inflammation levels go up, the extra weight we're carrying increases stress on our back, um, our muscle strength decreases, and ground reaction force increases, and all of these factors work together to either cause or worsen back pain. So now that we know 
increased body weight can contribute to health, health problems, including back pain, you know, what can we do to reduce this risk? So we like to look at the role of diet and nutrition. So a suboptimal diet is an also a modifiable risk factor when considering the causes of pain as our bodies age. So on the left here, we have an exam examples of foods that are not the healthiest foods in the world, foods that promote inflammation in the body, promote weight gain, um, while providing very few nutritional benefits. On the right, you can see fresh, colorful produce that are high in antioxidants, vitamins and minerals, and serve to reduce inflammation in the body. Research shows that our diet plays a significant role in inflammation and pain in the body. And inflammation is an important underlying mechanism for the development of many chronic diseases, including type two diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, and cancer. Um, increased inflammation in the body is also found in patients with chronic pain. So by recognizing foods that, we can, that can reduce inflammation, such as plant-based foods, as well as those that promote inflammation, we can make diet modifications that decrease inflammation in the body and help to reduce pain. All right, so just a brief graphic here. Um, this is the anti-inflammatory diet that we like to promote here at the Back and Neck Pain Center, and we really recommend to help reduce um, inflammation in the body. So on the left, we have food pyramids for the Mediterranean diet and also the whole foods plant-based. Oh, we don't have that one, I'm sorry, for the Mediterranean diet. Um, these are anti-inflammatory diets that provide excellent guidelines for how to make diet modifications that will reduce inflammation in the body. Um, inflammation in the body can either be positively or negatively affected by the foods that we eat. Um, Pro-inflammatory foods or foods that increase inflammation in the body include saturated fats found in meat, especially red meat and whole fat dairy products. Um, trans fats, which are find, found in hydrogenated oils used to make processed or packaged baked goods and crackers. Um, Omega-6 fatty acids, which are found in oils, such as corn oil, safflower oil, and sunflower oil, um, and in sugar and sugar-laden foods. Um, Anti-inflammatory foods can help to reduce inflammation markers in the body and include foods high in omega-3 fatty acids, such as canola oil and walnuts, um, monounsaturated fats, such as olive oil and avocados, um, and fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. The more colorful, the better, um, and then many different herbs, spices, and teas. So unmodifiable risk factors. So some unmodifiable risk factors include female gender, um, specifically with regard to the increased risk of osteoporosis in females, our genet genetic makeup, past trauma or injuries, um, past work exposures, and social and demographic factors that increase our risk for certain conditions. So these are all factors that we can't change that can cause back pain as we age. And while we cannot change these factors, understanding our risk can help us to recognize conditions when they occur and take steps to prevent future issues. All right, so here's just um, a little guideline for self-care um, and some home activities to manage spine-related disorders, some things that you can do in a preventative capacity as well. So some things we saw, spoke about already, keeping a strong core with exercise, um, eating right and considering an anti-inflammatory diet, losing weight if you're overweight or obese, um, promoting a good posture, both seated, standing, and sleeping posture is all important for your back health, quitting smoking if you're smoking, please quit. Uh, managing your mood and mental health, taking time to meditate and manage stress, um, supplementing calcium and vitamin D, again, especially important for women um, as you age and after menopause, um, and performing weight-bearing exercises. All right, so this is just a quick guideline that we provided on treating back pain at home with ice or heat. So we get a lot of questions about this. People don't know when to use what. Um, so ice and heat are thermal agents that can be used for muscle spasm, joint stiffness, muscle aches, or pain and swelling. So um, on the left here, we have the applications of ice. So ice constricts blood vessels and reduces swelling. Um, it should be used after an injury or after performing a strenuous activity. It can be used for 15 to 20 minutes, the first 48 to 72 hours after an injury. Um, it can be used three to four times a day. So quick guideline, um, you can use ice packs, you can use a bag of ice or bag of frozen vegetables. Um, always have a barrier between your skin and the ice, and please try not to fall asleep while you have ice on your body. Um, and on the right here, we can see more about the applications of heat. So heat dilates blood vessels and increases circulation of the blood. It can loosen stiff joints and muscles and decrease muscle spasms and pain. Um, moist heat can be used for 15 to 20 minutes, three to four times a day, 48 to 72 hours after an injury. Um, moist heat can also be used for chronic conditions such as arthritis. Um, using a moist heat pad, a microwavable heat pack, or a hot water bottle are all, are all appropriate, as is a warm shower. Um, and again, always just to remember to put a barrier between your skin and the heat source and not to fall asleep on heat because you could burn your skin. 
All right, I'm going to pass you back to Dr. Ben, and he's just going to go over our risk assessment tool. So this is a risk assessment tool that everybody can just take a quick look at now. We actually use this in clinical practice. Uh, many insurance companies and Medicare like us to use functional outcome-based tools to measure a baseline of how problems like we talked about can affect your function, your hobbies, your activities of daily living. So let's just stop for about 60 seconds. We'll come back to this at the end and just take a look at each of those um, questions and just kind of jot it down if you have a pen and paper in front of you or just remember how many you checked off. I think there's about 10 or 11. That's nine. So check off, um, just take a look at them and just put in your mind how many you had and then we'll come back to this. I'll give you everybody about 60 seconds to just take a look at it. Okay, so we're going to move on. So now what we're going to talk about is, you know, we're talking about, you know, age-related back problems. Um, so let's talk about some of the anatomical things. We kind of briefly touched on it, but here you can see some pictures of what we're talking about. So on your far left, um, obviously arthritis is something that most people who get older have. You know, it's wear and tear from just living our lives and doing everything we've done for many, many years. But that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be symptomatic. Again, we talked about some of the risk factors um, and how they can cause and perpetuate back problems. So one of them are the facet joints or the joints of the spine. So you can see on the far left, it's pointing out the normal joints of the lower back. And then in the picture below it, it talks about arthritic facet joints. And you can kind of see how the picture shows an outline of red around the joint, meaning that the joint has become narrowed, the red indicates inflammation, and again, a thinning disc is very common that helps cause that joint to become inflamed and thinner as well. So those two things we commonly see together, and very commonly they can cause back pain and even sometimes sciatic pain. Below that picture, there's a picture of the pelvis. The middle part of the bone is called the sacrum, the outer parts, or the larger bones are called the ilium, and that's called the sacroiliac joint. That's a very common reason for back pain as well, and it happens to people throughout their lives, not just age. Radicular pain refers to nerve injuries. Muscle pain refers to pain that can occur inside a muscle due to either an overall tightening of the muscle or something we call trigger points. Trigger points are focal contraction knots that occur in a muscle, and most people have them up in here. You can kind of feel a knot or what feels like a marble. Those generate pain as well. And those can happen from overuse, from underlying structural problems like we've talked about. Um, and those are things that can happen as we get older too. We go outside, we try to rake, you know, we take the garbage out and all of a sudden our muscle gets tight. So muscle is definitely another factor. And then lastly, disc pain. So you can see on this picture of the disc on your far right, the first picture is a cross cut looking through the disc down at it. And then the one on the far right is a side view. So the arrow, the black arrow is pointing to a bulging disc. And you can see it compared to the one above how that disc is bulging out and pinching the nerve. That generally happens as we get older as well. And then in the middle picture where the cross cut is, the red arrow, you can see that the jelly normally stays in the middle of the disc. In this particular case, it's migrated outside towards the nerve and it pinches the nerve and that's called a herniated disc. Uh, it's very much like a jelly donut. I like to use that analogy. So the jelly has moved from the middle of the donut out to the side. Next slide. Um, so what are some conservative things that people do that's recommended before some more invasive treatments? Um, here at the hospital at Mather and in general, we like to use a stepped approach, which we'll go over in a little bit, but that means always starting with the most conservative, least invasive treatment. And why is that? Because probably 80% or better of patients respond to one of these types of modalities, whether it's physical therapy or chiropractic medicine. And this is for symptoms that are happening as we get older, they just aren't going away, they become chronic. It's not a simple strain. Um, at that point, 
the risk of letting it go on and on and fighting through the pain only actually can cause more structural damage and more issues. So attention to it makes more sense. Next. So I'm a chiropractic physician and doctor, so I'm going to talk about chiropractic care. I've been in practice for 38 years. Um, when we've done these seminars live, I can always get a sense and a pulse for how many people have been to chiropractors. I can't do that in this type of a format. So I'm just going to briefly go over what chiropractors are and do. Uh, chiropractors basically focus on the spine and musculoskeletal system. It's a drug-free, hands-on approach. Um, we do very comprehensive physical examinations, make diagnoses, and practice evidence-based patient-centered care. We use imaging when necessary, and that includes x-rays, MRIs. And interesting chiropractic care over the several last couple of decades has now been shown in clinical research and in some very good journals, as well as some very good agencies and top-notch agencies that are actually now recommending chiropractic care as a first-line approach for back pain. Um, chiropractors generally use therapeutic exercises, make dietary recommendations, a lot of the things that we've talked about. Um, there are several chiropractors affiliated with our hospital that have been vetted by our hospital. And if someone comes to our center, we'll oftentimes make a recommendation uh, for chiropractic care if it's, that's what the patient wants to do. And it's by the recommendation of our clinical staff. Next slide. So some things that chiropractors do, if you know the audience, if you've been to a chiropractor, this may look like review, but it includes things like spinal mobilization and manipulation. The top left-hand picture is a picture of a doctor actually doing a mobilization procedure. Um, there's other types of techniques which we'll talk about. The far top right is an instrument-assisted type of manipulative procedure where that particular gun actually kind of pulses the joint. And we use exercises. You can see the woman on the ball with TheraBands. We make those recommendations routinely. We use traction. You can see on the bottom picture in the middle, the woman is on her back and there's a cervical traction device. And then we also use modalities, passive modalities like cold laser therapy, stimulation and heat. Next slide. One of the things that I do in my clinical practice and many chiropractors do as well is called spinal disc compression, decompression. So this decompressive technique uses a table to actually debulge the disc, create more space where there's spinal stenosis. If you look at the top left picture, you can see where the red arrows are, that those bones are compressing. And you can see that the disc, which is the jelly between those two bones, is bulging outwards. That pinches the nerve. It causes pain. It can cause back pain. It can cause sciatica. Um, decompression is using a table that creates a very gentle tractional force in the long axis plane. So if you look on the bottom right-hand picture, you can see that person's on their stomach. The one next to that picture is person's on their back. And it's a very gentle distractional force that creates negative pressure in the disc to actually decrease the bulge and actually pull away from the nerve. Next. <clears throat> this is a picture of a table called the Cox table. Um, I have I have used this extensively throughout my career. It's a modern technological um, table and technique that not only helps to stabilize the joints and move the joints without doing that classical type of cracking manipulation. By the way, if you've been to a chiropractor and nobody ever experienced that, it's when manipulation occurs, it creates a pop noise or a crack noise. People call it cracking in the back. Actually, that's not what's happening. When that manipulation occurs, the noise is nothing more than gas that escapes the joint. It's kind of like a soda can. When you pop the top off the soda can, it makes a pop noise because it's under pressure. To get The joint in the body is very similar, so it'll make the same noise. But there are some people who can't tolerate and should never have that technique. So the art of being good at this is knowing which technique is best. This particular technique I think is excellent. It gets great clinical results, which I'll show you in a second. But this doctor on the top hand left, he has his hand on the spine. His left hand is pushing the table gently up and down, and it distracts the lower back joints as well as the disc. And then on the top right, you can do it on the neck very similar. So that headpiece actually just moves up and down, back and forth and side to side very gently without having to do that high velocity type of manipulation. Um, I'm going to show you a research study in a second, but you look at that bottom right MRI, look at the picture on the left, where the red circle is, you can see the disc is actually pushing out, that's called a herniated disc. Months later, and this is actually a case of mine, um, you can see that the disc actually decreased in its size and reduced, meaning that disc herniations that happen can be reduced due to this decompressive type of traction. Next slide. So this is a pub, this is actually a paper I published in research that I did several years ago. And to make a long story short, 
Um, you can see on the top picture, that's another case of where the disc is sticking out. It's very obvious. And then the green arrow shows how that was reduced in size over the course of time. Uh, this was a 27 patient study and almost two thirds of the patients that we treated on repeat imaging, the disc herniation either completely disappeared or was significantly reduced to size along with um, extreme um, reduction in symptoms and return to work. Next slide. So lastly, um, you know, if you had asked someone or a physician or a doctor or an agency, like I mentioned before, you know, should I go to a chiropractor? Is that something I should do? Well, 25 years ago, the answer would have been, are you crazy? No, don't go to a chiropractor. However, in the last 25 years, there's been dozens of random controlled clinical trials, which are excellent research studies that have shown the efficacy of chiropractic in in its treatment of back and neck pain. In fact, one of the latest ones was actually published in the Journal of American Medical Association, and it actually looked at um, the effect of usual medical care versus chiropractic and medical collaborative care. And this was done in the military and hands down patients, as you would guess, patients who saw both got the best results. Next slide. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about another type of modality called physical therapy. The physical therapy department um, in our hospital is, is excellent. And um, the person who's going to address you now is Lisa Marie Puglisi. She's certified in McKenzie therapy, which is another type of technique, which is phenomenal for decreasing back pain and sciatic pain. And she is an absolute expert in it. I'm gonna let Lisa talk to you about it now. Hi everyone. Um, as Dr. Ben said, I am from Mather's outpatient physical therapy department, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we could do for you um, and your back pain with physical therapy. Um, so a lot of the symptoms that we look for with age-related back pain is number one pain. That's the primary reason patients come to see us. Um, we really want to know a lot about your pain, where it's located, how it came to be, you know, what makes it worse, what seems to make it better. That can really tell us a lot. We are wanting to know what kind of loss of movement you have, because um, that could really lead to structural changes in the spine. Uh, we also want to know what kind of decreased activity you've had. So things that you haven't been doing, um, you know, loss of functional ability because of the pain. Um, and as Dr. Pain, uh, Dr. Ben said, a sedentary lifestyle can lead to a lot more other issues, um, such as loss of balance and also fear avoidance. So now you're starting to kind of avoid the, the movements or the activities that you like to do because you're fearful that you're going to have some sort of pain. Next. Um, so can we help with back pain? Short answer is yes. Um, we address all the things that I mentioned above, um, pain, decreased mobility, um, limitations with physical activity. Um, there was a study that was recently done and published in Osteoporosis International. Um, and what they did is they took patients that were 60 years and older and they, um, they were patients who had um, hyperkyphosis, which really is just increased thoracic um, flexion in that mid-back area. And they put them into two groups. So one group did physical therapy um, and another group had um, postural education. So the physical therapy group did physical therapy three times a week six uh, for six months and addressed things like postural strengthening, um, functional core strengthening and flexibility. And what they found was that um, the physical therapy group had improved their thoracic kyphosis by three degrees. And it doesn't seem like a lot, but it takes five years to actually get into five degrees of thoracic kyphosis. So actually it was, it was um, quite a bit. And what was even more interesting is that patients who are 75 and older actually had an improved, an increased response, even more than the three degrees. So physical therapy can actually make structural changes. Um, so what we would do for physical therapy is when you come in for an examination, um, a board certified physical therapist will evaluate you and we look through your posture, you know, we get a strong history, kind of the whole history about um, your neck or back issue. Uh, we do neurological testing, so we could do um, sensation, reflexes if necessary. We check your strength of your core and your lower extremity, your upper extremities if we're looking at neck pain, and then we check for movement loss. And um, as far as treatment goes, next slide. This is actually our clinic up top there. Um, and what separates us from other physical therapy clinics is that we do the McKenzie method. 
And the McKenzie method is really um, an effective and evidence-based approach to treating the spine. And what we do is we bring you through a series of different movements and kind of see what your directional preference is, which is a movement that will help to relieve your pain. Once we find that, we use that as your treatment and we kind of create a whole treatment program based off of that specific type of movement. It really focuses on patient independence because we'll give you these exercises and have you continually do them at home. Um, and that's how you're gonna get the best results is really being diligent with the exercises. Um, we work a lot on your postural stabilization. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, we work a lot on your postural stabilization. We do core strengthening. We'll do functional exercises like bending and lifting. You know, any specific type of activity you like to do, you can talk to us about it and we'll create that as part of your strengthening program to make sure that you're strong enough to do those things. And lastly, flexibility exercises, which are really important. And then when you're done with physical therapy, we really want to give you symptom management techniques, things that you can go ahead and you can do at home. If you ever start to get any sort of back pain again, you can kind of go into that, those exercises and that should help to keep it at bay. We set you up with um, a comprehensive home exercise program because we want you to maintain that strength that you've gained. Um, posture is really going to play a big role in it. Even once you're done with physical therapy, pretty much for the rest of your life, you still want to maintain that, that postural um, stability that you've worked so hard for. And lastly, you want to make sure that you're remaining active, that you've gotten to the point where you're able to garden again or golf or play with your grandkids. So you want to really try and maintain that. Um, so physical therapy really can help to decrease your pain. It can help you have better posture, stand taller, feel better about yourself, and it's really a great first line of defense. I'll hand it back over to Caitlin. All right. Thanks, Lisa. So again, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our program here at Mather at the Back and Neck Pain Center. Um, so how is the Back and Neck Pain Center different? <clears throat> so here at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we provide evidence-based multidisciplinary care, which is customized by a clinical team consisting of a collaborating physician, um, myself, the nurse practitioner, and a whole team of other providers. So speaking of <clears throat> multidisciplinary, it refers to the fact that we have multiple providers from different disciplines, and this includes spine surgery, interventional pain management, physical therapy, and chiropractors, and we all work together to coordinate your care. So we meet once weekly and we review patient charts to allow for providers from different backgrounds to weigh in on the selected treatment plan and provide their, their unique perspectives. Um, at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we also aim to reduce recurrent episodes of back and neck pain in the future by teaching about how to adopt a healthy lifestyle, healthy diet, and a healthy exercise plan. We also avoid the use of high-risk pain medications here. So while one of our goals, of course, is to alleviate your pain, uh, we want to find the underlying cause of your pain and provide treatments that address this underlying cause. Um, and here at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we also identify and address disparity of care factors. So there are many factors that make it difficult for individuals to access treatment, and this includes financial obstacles, transportation issues, mobility issues, comorbid medical conditions, um, mental health issues, and just difficulty managing multiple appointments with different providers. So at the Back and Neck Pain Center, we aim to identify these factors and provide assistance to ensure that you're able to get the treatment that you need. Um, and the step ladder approach. So this, this graphic here depicts our approach to treatment at the Back and Neck Pain Center. We use what we like to call a step ladder approach. And with this approach, we aim to provide the least invasive effective treatment option for your condition. So for most people, this means starting with conservative treatment measures that we discuss, such as physical therapy or chiropractic care. Now, if you've already tried conservative measures without improvement, or if your condition warrants further intervention, we may start a little higher on the ladder with interventional pain management or one of our support programs. So in cases where you have red flags, um, which are signs or symptoms that indicate an urgent condition, we may send you directly to a surgeon. So statistically, approximately 75% of our patients improve with conservative measures, um, but we continue to evaluate you throughout the course of treatment and recommend additional treatments or steps as appropriate. About 20% of our patients use um, interventional pain management treatment options, and about 5% of our patients have required spinal surgery. So our overall goal is to provide you with the most appropriate treatment for you and treatment that will be effective in reducing um, your pain and help you to regain function. Um, so now I'm just going to pass you back to Dr. Ben Eliyahu, and he's going to review your risk assessment results. So if you took the time to take um, that risk assessment tool that we talked about earlier and you uh, scored it, 
So basically, if you score two or three on that particular survey, that means you're experiencing currently a functional deficit that's affecting your functional activities and your activity of daily living and basically affecting your life. So that generally is something that we would use as a baseline score and then work to increase that, make that better by decreasing the score to zero. Um, so if you've scored two or three points on that survey, you would certainly benefit from seeing us at the back and neck pain center. Uh, as you can see from this slide, um, we can help make appointments for you. We accept almost every insurance plan. Um, and we hope you got a lot out of this seminar. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, it is common to experience back and neck pain problems as we get older due to the wear and tear, due to some of the things that we've talked about that are age-related changes, um, such as osteoporosis, uh, arthritis that occurs in our joints, spinal stenosis. Um, but recognizing when you need to get help, such as having chronic pain, severe unrelenting pain, a progressive deficit like increasing weakness or affected gait, um, things that are affecting your ability to enjoy life. That's time not to fight through the pain and it's time to actually seek out help. Adopting healthy lifestyles, we've demonstrated to you things that you can do right now based on this webinar to help yourself um, achieve better health through exercise and diet, um, posture, stop smoking, decreasing weight. Those are things that are manageable that you can modify that can help not only an episode that you're having currently, but also an episode that may happen to you down the line or even tomorrow. Um, so adopting healthy lifestyles is critical, as is exercise. And treatment, you have to know that treatment is available. We are here to help for anybody that wants that help. And we can take some questions now. Now, if you've, you can just take a look at this last slide. It's actually kind of cute. Um, sometimes back pain can be indicative of other problems. You can clearly see in this picture that uh, this guy has an issue that is not age related. So sometimes a good clinician has to be able to look at everything and look at the whole picture to figure out what's wrong with this guy. Um, so go ahead and put your questions in the q and I wanna thank everybody for attending today. I uh, hope you all learned something. Now we'll hang on and wait to see if there are any questions and answers that I can answer, that Caitlin, our nurse practitioner can answer, or our physical therapist can answer. And if you have any questions at all that um, you don't wanna ask here, if you just jot down our email address, or equally important, just write down that phone number. Um, if you call us, we'll certainly talk to anybody that calls us. So there are one, one question. Um, it says, what do we think about acupuncture and the use of a conversion table? So how about Caitlin, you address acupuncture and then Lisa Marie, you can, you can answer the conversion table or inversion table actually. <laughs> All right, so yes, acupuncture can be a great adjunct to treatment. Um, we typically don't recommend it for without an evaluation to make sure it's an appropriate treatment for your condition. Um, but for a lot of our patients, that is a great adjunct to um, other conservative treatment measures like physical therapy or chiropractic care. Um, we do have some community acupuncturists and some chiropractors who do have acupuncture available in their offices. Um, and we have seen patients benefit from that practice. Uh, as far as the inversion table goes, um, it really it really can kind of help for almost like a, sh a little bit of a short period of time because when you're underneath in that inverted position, it kind of creates some joint space. But then when you get off of it and you go back to your daily living, those symptoms can kind of rise again. So it's really not addressing the root of the problem, although it may give you temporary relief, you really should be evaluated and come in to kind of get an assessment to see what the source of the problem is and how we can help you over a prolonged period of time. I'm going to add something to that. So when people ask me about that too, I obviously say what Lisa said, but in addition, I always tell people before you actually try that, it's important to know that you can actually go inverted. Um, a lot of times as we get older, it becomes not tolerable. We tend to increase our blood pressure. It can increase our intraocular pressure and that can give us headaches. Um, so if you're going to think about doing an inversion table, I would recommend that you maybe lay on your bed and just kind of lean off the edge of the bed if it doesn't hurt you to do so. And just make sure you can actually be upside down a little bit. Um, there are some people that can't tolerate that at all and it actually can contribute to hypertension, increased ocular pressure in your eyes and lead to eye issues. Issues. 
Um, and then lastly, if you know for a fact that you've had imaging in your spine and you have severe degenerative disc changes, your discs are very thin, um, they're very deteriorated, that type of tractional force going upside down in an inverted position can actually cause more tearing to that weakened disc and actually allow problems to occur even more. So I would say if it's something you really want to do, just be careful and just go slowly. Uh, the next question is, can massage therapy help with uh, chronic back pain? Again, I'll let Caitlin and Lisa Marie handle that. Okay, Caitlin first. Okay. So yes, um, massage therapy can help with chronic back pain. Um, it certainly can help if there's a lot of muscle involvement, muscle tension, trigger points. Um, it's something that we do have a component of in physical therapy. I'm sure Lisa can speak to that better than I can. Um, but again, it's something that we need to make sure it's appropriate um, for, for your back, that the source of your pain actually is your muscles, um, that is muscle tension or muscle spasms, um, to know if that would be the most appropriate treatment uh, for you. And during our evaluation, we also assess um, the tightness in the musculature. So if we feel that it would benefit from massage therapy, we do do medical massage along with PT at times. Um, and it really can help to loosen up the musculature, but we also want to stabilize you so that once everything's loose, everything can be maintained in that position. Um, so yeah, we do, we can correlate it depending on what we feel that you need when we assess you. Thank you. Uh, the next question uh, is a person is asking, she's about to have radio frequency ablation and do we agree with this? Well, that's a loaded, difficult question. Um, we don't know anything about you. So for the rest of the audience, radio frequency ablation is a burning of the nerve endings in the joints generally of the spine. So is it appropriate? Well, if the pain generator has been shown to absolutely be the joint, and how do you identify that pain generator? Um, it's done through something called blocks or facet blocks, where they inject a little lidocaine, a little cortisone into the joint. And if that gives someone significant relief, even if it's for a few days, then that generally means that that's most likely the pain generator. Then the pain physician will actually do it a second time to make sure that the same thing happened. If both times, the pain generator has been identified to be the facet joint or the joint where they're going to do the radio frequency ablation, um, then they will go ahead and burn the nerve. And that gives people anywhere from a few months to two years of relief. The other thing that people need to remember is that if the joint is ablated, that nerve has been burned, but it will grow back. So there's a good chance that two years from now that could come back. And this is also for people who have already tried things like conservative therapy, like physical medicine, or I mean, physical therapy or chiropractic medicine, and that's not helped either. So that would be an appropriate thing to do if the pain generator has been shown to be the joint and you responded to two blocks, two facet blocks. Anything anybody want to add to that? Caitlin, Lisa? Okay, next question is, um, what is the best position for sleeping to reduce discomfort? Lisa, you wanna handle that? Uh, yes, um, so we usually say one pillow underneath the head. Um, laying on your back or on your side is ideal. If you're gonna lay on your side, you just wanna make sure that you're not bringing your knees um, above where your hip level is. So you don't wanna get into that fetal position. Sometimes putting a pillow between the knees can help that. Um, those are usually the best positions. Um, I'll, Take the next one um, as far as going for physical therapy. Um, we do have an outpatient physical therapy. It's right across from Mather's main entrance. It's 125 Oakland. And just as an aside, so if someone wanted to get physical therapy here, uh, generally uh, a referral is needed. So you would call the number, um, see Caitlin, our nurse practitioner first, she would do an exam, get your records, and then she, if it's appropriate, um, she would make the referral to the physical therapy department. Uh, the next question is, she, someone was advised to take a vanity because of osteoporosis. Um, so how do you feel about medication and its side effects for osteoporosis care? Caitlin, I'll let you take that as a medical question. Sure. So 
Um, certainly, whenever you're prescribed a medication, um, I would assume that you've undergone an evaluation with your provider. So I, I would defer to their judgment with that. But just as a general um, aside, Avenity is typically prescribed when there's a very high risk of fracture um, with patient with osteoporosis. So typically, when a doctor is or provider is prescribing that, they're they're really looking at the risk versus benefit. Um, you know, there are side effects associated with some osteoporosis medication. But typically, if you're being prescribed that, there's a, a good reason why. Um, so I, of course, would not advise you to go off of your medication without discussing it with the prescriber. Um, but there are a lot, a lot of um, benefit, benefits, there's benefits to having, um, being medicated for osteoporosis. There are medications that can help to reduce risk of fracture. Um, but again, just to, something that you, you know, we would need to know more about the case to really advise. Uh, Caitlin, the next question also is about medication. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm Elisa. Um, okay, so this is speaking about the medication Lyrica. So this is a nerve pain medication. I'm not sure what the question is asking. It's just saying it is the drug. Um, so it is a medication that it can be used to treat pain. Um, again, a lot of time nerve-related pain. So we do see that in patients sometimes who have, you know, spinal stenosis or radiculopathy. They might be taking that medication. Um, it's not something that we prescribe here at the Back and Neck Pain Center. It is a narcotic medication, um, but certainly something that our pain management providers do prescribe. And it can help um, with that radicular pain, um, a lot of times with pain, um, like neuropathic pain. So like diabetic neuropathy is something that we, we would see patients take for that as well. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I apologize. I'm not sure exactly what the question was asking, but it is something that can be used to treat pain. Um, I don't think it's the only thing that someone should take or do if you're no, in a lot no. of pain. A good valuation, in addition to what else can you do besides taking Lyrica, is, is often recommended by most spine providers. So if you're in a lot of pain and that's the only thing you're doing, you know, I think maybe sometimes there are some other things that could be done in conjunction with taking Lyrica. Uh, Lisa, there's a question about desirable sleep position. Um, so as I said a little bit earlier, it, it would either be supine, um, which is laying on your back. You could put um, one pillow up underneath your knees, one pillow up underneath your head, and then lying on either side. I wouldn't recommend laying on your stomach. Uh, when you're lying on your side, you just want to make sure you're not in that fetal position and that you're just having your knees not go up above where the hips are. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is regarding some nutritional supplements for people who are experiencing some issues with their spine. First one is regarding glucosamine. Um, so yes, there are some supplements that are marketed, glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate, sometimes with MSM. Uh, so the research here and the evidence here is mixed. There are some studies that show that it, compared to placebo, it does nothing. Yet there are some studies that show it does seem to help with things like knee pain. I'm not aware of any significant controlled trials that looked at back pain with glucosamine. However, I am aware of a couple of uh, veterinarian studies which supplied glucosamine to, uh, to dogs. And they did a crossover, meaning they gave glucosamine in the food to some dogs. They gave a placebo to other dogs. They found that the dogs who had uh, hip problems got better while taking glucosamine. And then they switched the groups. And then the, the dogs that got better with glucosamine all of a sudden had hip problems and gait issues again. So what does that mean? So for me, that means that, you know, you could try it. And if it, you find it's helping you, I think the evidence is mixed in the research science. But if you find empirically or anecdotally that it does help you, I would suggest you take it. Um, our joint supplements that we see advertised on TV, I'm not sure which ones you're referring to. Um, Caitlin, you want to take that one? Sure. So without knowing, um, again, what supplements you are seeing on TV, it's really hard to give you advice um, as to whether or not that's something you should take. Um, if it is something that's like a glucosamine, like Dr. Ben um, spoke to, you know, if, it, if it, there's, there's mixed evidence, you know, about that. So certainly some people do find that they benefit from it, so they could take that. Um, I don't generally advise people to take medication or supplements that they see on television without discussing it with their provider to make sure it's an appropriate um, supplement for them. There are some supplements that can interfere with prescription medications or can exacerbate um, conditions that you do have. So definitely something that, you know, if it looks like something that, you know, would be good for you or, or fits the condition that you have to bring it to the attention of your provider um, and that we encourage our patients here to do that as well too. Let me know what, they're, what they saw on TV and we'll discuss if that's appropriate for you. A good resource is the National Institute of Health has a specific section on the National Institute of Health Complementary Medicine. And on that site, they actually do a really great job of listing 
different types of supplements that have some really significant research that help. Uh, for example, most people don't know this, but things like turmeric, there's actually some decent research on the use of turmeric for inflammation. So I would direct you to go to that website, which the National Institute of Health has the complementary medicine division. And they look through all kinds of herbs and different supplements and they show you which one is really evidence-based that there's some decent clinical trials on that can be helpful versus the ones that there's absolutely no research for. And they even discuss some of the things that Caitlin just mentioned, some of the herbs and some of the supplements that can actually affect the medication or medical condition that you're currently um, experiencing. Like I know from clinical practice that, you know, we talked about glucosamine and chondroitin. Um, I have some patients who are diabetic that actually their sugar goes up when they take glucosamine. So those are the kinds of things you need to be aware of. And as Caitlin said, you know, really you should talk to your healthcare provider. Um, Lisa, take the next question. Yep. Um, so a traction table can actually be um, pretty effective. We actually have a traction table here. So what we do is we just, um, when we evaluate you, we'll see if you're appropriate to, um, to have use of the table and then we'll set you up on it. And what it really does is it also helps to kind of create some joint space in there and kind of relieve some pain if there's any compression. Um, I Thank everybody for attending. Uh, I'm not familiar with any Larry King advertisement as far as nutritional supplements go, so I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. Um, then the question was about collagen, and honestly, I don't know anything about that either. Anybody else have anything to input about that? Now, again, it's a nutritional supplement. Um, I don't know much evidence that it would really help with the spinal conditions that we discussed here today um, with back pain. It's generally a well-tolerated supplement for most people, but again, something that we would want to know a little more about your history before advising you to take. Um, but typically not a lot of side effects with that. Um, you know, if you're talking about like a bone broth type supplement where you, you know, it's a powdered form of that. Um, some people, you know, tolerate that well. But again, I, I don't know that it would be very effective in, in treating most spinal conditions. Great. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you, Caitlin, Dr. Ben Eliyahu, and Lisa for presenting. That was a great presentation. Once you all exit the webinar, you'll be redirected to complete a brief survey. If you could please complete that, your feedback is extremely important to us, and it helps us to plan our future programs. Thank you again for joining us. And if you'd like to see previous and older Healthy You content that we've put out, you could visit our website at www.matherhospital.com dot org backslash healthy you that's you as in university everybody have a great rest of your day thank you